Well, thank you all for uh, joining us on an evening of active Democratic voting and uh, significant reigning. This event marks the one-year anniversary and the 12th installment of our Bob and Elizabeth Dole series on leadership. As some of you who have been here with us before know that the kind of purpose of this leadership is to call on, I'm sorry, the purpose of this series is to call on leaders from national and local politics, from arts, education, advocacy, to grapple with the question of what are the characteristics and circumstances that allow some people to enable true leadership. You know, what enables some of us to struggle to overcome the obstacles and unite the diverse interests that are part of any dynamic and true democracy. And so we are really extremely fortunate to be having our first year anniversary with three legislators who live this question every single day. Um, I should also just note that we're really very proud to name this series uh, in honor of the extraordinary service of Bob and Elizabeth Dole. Both are proud partisans in the truest sense, who over long careers have overcome a lot of real adversity and shown both the confidence and the creativity to dignify differences and build coalitions and actually make the country a better place. Um, I should just note as we kind of enter the discussion that when Senator Dole joined with Senators Daschle, Baker, and Mitchell to help found the BPC, there were a few ideas that kind of you know, animated the ambition and provide a little context for today. Um, the first is that we are aggressively bipartisan. We're not nonpartisan or postpartisan or metapartisan, but actually recognize that you know, the story of this country has not been 200 years of placid cohesion. It's about the good fight. And what we believe the essence of bipartisanship is is creating the kind of resiliency that allows us to have consistent policy going forward. The second idea we talked about a little bit uh, in the green room is that they wanted to make sure that we are in the arena. So we're not a think tank in that traditional sense of having a lot of smart people think big thoughts and hit print and then through some wonder of hubris imagine that the world is going to give a damn. We actually try to combine advocacy with aggressive analysis and we have a team of lobbyists who come visit with your staff on almost daily basis to talk about the shared conclusions of our policy projects. And then finally, they helped us appreciate very quickly the um, fact that the vast majority of our public servants are very good people grappling with very bad incentives. And to think about how we as an organization could find some ways to help you all overcome those challenges and actually get stuff done. And so it is with that entry that I should just say a few words about the legislators to my left. Um, first of all, uh, I guess going down to the end, uh, Representative Chrissy Houlihan from Pennsylvania's 6th District, which is a suburb of West Philadelphia. She serves on the Armed Services, Foreign Affairs, and Small Business Committees. Spent three years in the Air Force on active duty as a military engineer, working on air and space defense technologies, and then 13 years in the Air Force Reserves, becoming an Air Force captain and also served as the chief operating officer of several successful companies. We had a wonderful session with uh, Representative Houlihan and uh, Senator Coons talking about what the challenges are um, broadly facing our desire to have a competitive capitalist society that also has benefits that are shared broadly. And so we'll hopefully touch uh, on a bunch of that. Uh, next, uh, Representative uh, Elizabeth Slotkin from uh, Michigan 8th District, which is the northern Detroit suburbs, serves on the Armed Services and Homeland Security Committees. Uh, Representative Slotkin chose to pursue a career in national service following the 9-11 terrorist attacks, um, recruited by the CIA and spent three tours in Iraq as a military expert. It's also in between some of those uh, overseas experiences, uh, served in the Office of National, Director of National Intelligence and as Acting Assistant Secretary for International Security Affairs. And to my immediate left, Representative Abigail Spanberger from uh, Right here in the flood zone, the Virginia 7th, west of Richmond, serves on uh, Foreign Affairs and Agriculture Committee, served as a federal agent with the U.S. Postal Inspection Service, where she investigated narcotics and money laundering cases, and over eight years in the CIA as a case officer, and has also worked in the private sector, helping colleges and universities increase graduation rates, something we are focused on a great deal, and also thinking about issues around diversity on campuses. So. Um, here we are. Now, um, those of you who um, also have uh, teenage daughters might have recognized that uh, we came on stage as the song Badass Woman was being played. It's a uh, Megan Trainer song. Um, if I can just summarize, it's I'm a force of nature you can't ignore. Never second guess me because baby, I'm the boss. Don't underestimate me because I'm the one in charge. So with that 
predicate, I will now try to moderate um, this panel. And I have a couple of questions just for you kind of collectively and then a few that focus on some of your individual um, legislative accomplishments. But so this kind of badass national security woman thing, like how did, where did that get started? And what, you know, what, it's kind of fun. Um, <laughs> whose idea was it? I'll, I'll take a crack at that. I think they're on. You've got to pretend you're Elvis. And give me okay. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Uh, so I think it came of kind of a serendipitous occasion when several of us were out, uh, as candidates are apt to do on the fundraising campaign trail. And we ran into each other almost exactly at the same time in the same place in California, none of us being from California. And we were going to be having back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back events, largely with the same group of people. And we realized that this was probably not optimal and that we probably probably should do something that was innovative and that, frankly, all of our teams discouraged us to do, which was join forces and to have one event for all of us. And in fact, we not only had one event for the, what, the three of us who were there, but we invited two other women who were also in the area at the same time, and we created the very first badass opportunity. And we realized in the power of that event that we were able to share all of our motivations and stories, all of the passions that we had, and that it was more powerful with more of us. And and so that we discovered this opportunity on the campaign trail together, we now have translated that into the work that we do on the House floor. And we continue to be, at this point, five badasses, and actually four, because Abigail would prefer not to be called a badass because she's from Virginia and she's polite. Um, <laughs> I'm from Philly, so I'm not, so I can, I can use the, those terms. <laughs> so that's kind of the inception of the, of Thanks, the idea. <laughs> I will just add, um, I think um, the, the, the idea of people who have served then running for Congress to continue service to their country was a really strong, powerful message in these last elections. And there is some commonalities among people who have served um, that run pretty deep so that when we got together, not only did we just sort of, this makes sense, but we actually really enjoy each other. And we all purposely got offices um, as close together as you can in a lottery system. Um, we spend a lot of our time together. If someone's had a bad day, you know, we're like, is this time to go out tonight? You know, do we need to rally, you know, somebody? And it, um, it, as I think often happens in some women's organizations, you go from working together and having a close working relationship to really being each other's support and you know friends. And so it makes it a pleasure, frankly, beyond the, um, the normal fundraising gig. Yeah. Well, and if I might add, just before all of this, uh, all of this happened that they're talking about, there was an element, and I know we've all experienced it, on the campaign trail when you walk into a room and you talk about your background, and somebody comes up to you and says, you're, you're kind of a badass, with a little bit of excitement and a little bit of interest, because some of the things that we're talking about and some of our backgrounds seem really unique because they haven't been kind of in the forefront outside of maybe TV shows. Um, and you know, we have certainly had boring days in our prior careers, but um, I, I think there was an element of just it being very new so, for a yeah, lot yes, of yes, people. Yes, yes, I am. <laughs> um, well, I'm the polite Virginian, so not so much, <laughs> but, um, but I, I think there was an element that it also came very naturally because this was the reaction that people were yeah. having to us. And so it became one of those things that people kept saying it. And after a while, I said, OK, fine. Yeah. So it seems really important on lots of levels, right? One thing that we often think about is like democracy is a team sport, right? I mean, politics is fundamentally about creating connections with people and having that level of trust. And while we often talk about this being kind of a question of partisan schism, We've recognized over the years that Democrats don't know Democrats and Republicans don't know Republicans, right? The, the kind of anonymity of constant fundraising, constant air travel has really kind of you know, deteriorated just that kind of quality of collaboration. People must be kind of jealous of you guys. I mean, what, you know, do, you, do you have a sense that this spirit of your club is something that other people aspire to? Does anyone, anyone ask if they could join? Uh, we actually did have one, a person asked to join um, uh, 
Connor, uh, Connor um, Lamb, Lamb, who actually came in on a, a special so, election. Yep. It wasn't part of the the original. Um, there's actually badasses, but there's also and the guys. Yeah. So there are the, the with know, honor guys. Yeah, right? you know, yeah. There's five of women, uh -huh. you know, and there's four guys who came in in this class who have service backgrounds. And Connor Lamb was a tenth. Uh -huh. And so we we had sort of the G9 that somebody named us, and I don't know where that came from. And we're sort of like the G9 plus Connor, you know, the G9 or the G10. So yes, they definitely have. have, have we've expanded our groups but I think it is important to expand and to and to say that this is a model of how we should be behaving with one another and it isn't just about service you know minds and hearts it's about the fact that we are a broken democracy right now and if we aren't trying to find our commonalities we're doomed um, and I would just add um, you know the the um, like first of all we have an ongoing text chain for the, the 10 of us, and that I think is sort of non, unending. Um, it's on signal, because we're all from the defense and security background, so it's not on regular text. We have a text chain, and Connor, we knew Connor was in when he um, asked to be in the text chain. That was how he officially came into the club. <laughs> um, but I, I do think that Congress is 435 entrepreneurs. It's not a chain of command organization. Most of us have worked in chain of command organizations for our careers. And um, therefore, the process of being a new freshman is getting to know all these different members. And I got to be honest, you got to sort out the workhorses from the show ponies. Mm -hmm. And that is an ongoing process. And um, the group that, especially when you have a service background, like I never have to question whether I'm with the workhorses. Mm -hmm. And if Abigail says, I have this great idea for a bill on rural broadband, if Abigail suggested it, I mean, I will always read everything, mm -hmm. but <laughs> I, I will, it, it's mm -hmm. like I'm 99% sure I will get on it. Whereas if there's something else that someone suggested, you just don't know what are they doing it for, what's the kind of hidden, you know, like punchline. And I don't know that everyone in Congress has a group that they know are like, these are my workhorses who have similar overlapping interests and I trust them with my reputation, with my voice, um, the way that we have. I do think people um, are just a little jealous of that. Yeah, sometimes. they should be a little jelly. So oh, can I add one last thing on that? Course. Because with the G with the ten, um, we are diverse. Even though we are all of service, you know, one of us comes from Maine, one of us comes from California, one's in the Hispanic Caucus, one is, you know, uh, from um, Staten Island. You know, and <laughs> enough said. It has a big mouth on him. But you know, but we don't have all of the same opinions. And so even though we may vote differently, um, we respect that the other one is coming with true intentions. And it's interesting to listen to their arguments about one one vote or another. And I, I think there's been a challenge in the introduction to your question. You were talking about, you know, politics is about finding, uh, you know, solutions. Or I, I can't remember exactly what, you, what it is that you said, but I was struck by that because I think we're reaching a challenging place where sometimes people don't necessarily want to find solutions, which is astounding and, and challenging for me to face and digest. Um, and I think that with some of us who came into Congress together with similar backgrounds, um, it, it, we share some of that sentiment. And so we are constantly seeking people who want to work, be it across party lines, within our own caucus, um, or on issues that may be of top priority to some of us and, and maybe not top of mind for others, like broadband. Um, but I think another thing is we have been constantly churning, trying to find people beyond you know, our what is a wonderful group of people and strong members of Congress, but also we have been trying to get out and meet people, particularly on the other side of the aisle. And so having sort of 10 of us out there all the time saying, who can we work with? Who can we bring to the table? At a time where there's not a lot of people who want to come to the table, um, I, I think that's been helpful. We have found the table can be a scary place, um, especially when you have the bipartisan death hug as the kind of political entry point, which sometimes we are accused of, but let me ask you, um, you obviously bring service together and have a common history. You are also kind of the majority makers in the Democratic caucus. There's no kind of about You're that. You're the majority makers in the Democratic caucus. Um, with the... Sorry, I, I, I misspoke. <laughs> She's back. And not only did you um, three flip um, Republican seats, but seats that have been Republican for a long time time, if I have my math right, 48 years? 50. 50, now it's 50. 
almost 20 and over 160 years since Chester County had elected a Democrat. So, um, yeah. Yeah. What the heck? I don't know what's about I've been through Chester County, but um, how, what, that's placing a tremendous amount of strain. I mean, the Republican Party is having the same kind of you know, internal challenge. You know, the Democratic Party, I mean, how are you finding the challenge of being part of a party system where there are certainly great distinctions between where you are and where the president is, but also having a constituency that is certainly not aligned with where the kind of dominant energy, whether you call it the show horse energy or just the kind of Twitter energy of the Democratic Party? How do, how do you, is that something you navigate every day? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that um, the only reason we became representatives of these districts is because we are independently minded people. And we also had a stomach to say no to people, even when they say, well, everyone's doing this. And you're like, okay, and like, it's not third grade, you know? And, and um, I think that, um, if you're not independently minded and you're not looking to appeal to a broad base of people, you're not gonna win in these districts. You can run, but you're not gonna win. And I think that, um, you know, I always tell people who come to lobby me on this or that or the other, um, whether it's a union or a big company or whatever, I say, I am in a really independently minded district. I'm gonna be the person who reads every single bill because I can't just check the box when the Democratic Party says this is the bill that we're all, you know, we're all signing on to. Or, you know, I can't sign on to everything that's bipartisan, you know, even though I want to, because you have to really have your own mind of these things. And it's really amazing how many members of Congress walk onto the floor on both parties and both parties and just look at how you know the leader of their party or senior people in their party and they're like oh okay this is a yes okay we're yes um, and we do not i do not think e any of us um do that and have the luxury of doing that no in fact we sit on the floor even yeah. as at, at, at the very time. end saying okay where are we on all of this like why are you doing this why am i doing this yeah. just to just to make sure you're making good decisions especially right now with the national defense authorization act we've got, we have all these amendments coming through and we have a variety of perspectives and there's a couple times where you know i go into it saying okay this is why i think i'm a yes what, why are you a no? And and it, it's great to challenge yourself. And half the times, I'm not sure where the party is on it. But um, it, you know, I, I think the the other the benefit of being from a district like ours, right? Of district from districts like ours, is that we have the challenge every day of trying to please a broad swath of people, which is just impossible, right? So. We also then have the challenge of understanding a broad swath of people, because there are a lot of people in my district who didn't vote for me. Oh. There's a lot of people in my district who did. Um, but it is, it is a responsibility that in order to continue serving all of my constituents, all of our constituents, I have to be in tune with people across the perspective and the spectrum. And so I think that seats like ours are the seats that can truly be the the examples for how you lead in a divided okay. nation, how you try and bring people back together. Because if I can have people come up to me at an event and say, I didn't vote for you, but, and they say something that they're pleased with, like that's the first step towards getting away from this team sport notion of politics where it's win or lose and it's a zero sum game, because that doesn't serve our districts, particularly districts like ours, and it doesn't serve this country. So let me take, ask you about the, um the work, you know, we have the pleasure of working closely with uh, former Senator Olympia Snow, who helped me realize a while ago that um, independent thought takes time. You actually have to be able to read legislation. And one of the things that we are well aware of is that there are a lot of demands on your time and not a ton of time to sit back and close the door and bring in policy experts and dig into these. So talk a little bit about, you know, how are you managing your time. How do you make time to actually bring that kind of independent thought? And I guess the second question is, and how could the process make that 
easier. It's incredibly broken. I'm on three different committees, and sometimes they'll meet all three at the at same, same time. time. Yeah. And subcommittees as well. And then you're asked to basically gavel in to be present and literally leave at that point in time yeah. to gavel into the other committee meetings and then meet with constituents outside of the hallway at the same time. And so you're basically there for your five minutes of fame, you know, to ask your five minutes of questions. And that's why when you look at C-SPAN, there's no one in any of the rooms because we're all somewhere else doing something else. So it is a challenge to make sure that you're educating yourself on the things that you're supposed to be doing, which is sitting in the committee and hearing what people are asking and what they're talking about. Uh, one way that I think we've uh, innovated in some ways on is there's a great group, Congressional Research uh, Service, that I will say periodically to my team, hey, I don't know enough about fill in the blank. Can you please help me by bringing those folks in to brief me? And then we'll share with the offices, you guys do the same thing with ours, that we're bringing in somebody who's an expert on this or talking about that. Would you like to join us? And so we're trying to kind of collaborate even on how we're learning to make sure that we're getting ourselves up to speed. But it's an enormously broken process. Um, in addition to being in three different committee hearings at one time, you can also inevitably be being asked to be fundraising at the very same time, too. So it's a very, very broken system. We have put a lot of uh, energy into trying to help the Select Committee on Modernization because it feels like, as metaphor and as substance, that would be a place where we could at least start to provide you the kind of resources that would give you the space to do what you're describing. Do you have any optimism about that? And maybe are there any particular yeah. ideas that you would can like I, to see? Can I bring one up? Yeah. Uh, I, I got the chance to testify in front of the Select Committee on Modernization of Congress. And I was incredibly frustrated about this issue of schedule. It just feels asinine that we yesterday had a classified briefing for the entire House of Con the entire Congress uh, at the very same time that votes were supposed to be called. So we were literally supposed to all 435 of us be at the same place, in, you know, two, uh, two different places at the same time. So when I testified, my idea, which I don't think is a dumb one, is to do block scheduling like we do in high school. You know, you have the opportunity to rotate to different classes when you're a high schooler and have club opportunities and sports opportunities, and you have certain things at the same time every day. Why we cannot figure out how to manage schedules like that, I, it blows my mind. Um, and so I would love for you to help us on, on that. And on the, so first of all, I tell people back home, and they're shocked, because they should be, that votes are called about the same schedule as the Verizon cable guy coming mm -hmm. to fix your cable, like yeah. between 10 and 4. Right. And you're like, how can it be in 2019 I have to wait for the damn cable guy right. from 10 to 4? That is how votes are every day. And it throws off your schedule. You can't see people. Um, I do think the, the one big accomplishment that um, has actually started working is this idea that if 290 members of Congress actually sign on to a bill, then regardless of where it is in the committee process, Process, which is a whole other ball of wax, mm -hmm. it will go to the floor. And I think the first one we're poised to do that way is a really important one, which is the 9-11 Compensation Fund, which was about to run out, and we have a whole lot of first responders who are still dealing with serious health issues. And we worked in a bipartisan fashion to hit 290 and forced it to the floor. We have another couple of bills doing that. Um, that, to me, is the single most important accomplishment, because the committee structure is political. It's on its own schedule, this forces it if you do the work to whip votes. And I would add one more piece, a little bit on the wonky procedural piece. The procedural votes called the MTR motions to recommit mm -hmm. are sort of the weapon, if you will, of the minority party. Um, and so what you end up doing is you go to vote on a big piece of legislation, whatever parties in the minority will put forth this motion to recommit vote that has something truly controversial. So then, you know, and it's mostly people in district people who are making thoughtful decisions about pieces of legislation because they can't and don't want to just vote with the party to do so um, are the ones who are sometimes cross, you know, voting with the, the minority if you're in the majority and, and vice versa. Um, but they really serve no purpose. But the interesting thing, well, they do serve a purpose. It's to later use for attack ads. Right. Um, but what's the really interesting thing is they're actually one of the most interesting times to be on the floor because you're on the floor because you've just voted. And that's when the motion to recommit gets put forth. And then there's debate. And so you have almost every member of Congress is on the floor because we've just voted. The motion to recommit comes up. You don't go anywhere. You have hundreds of people on the floor engaged engaged together on what they're debating. But wouldn't it be a beautiful thing if you were actually sitting there, almost all members of Congress, watching them debate the bill you're actually going to vote on, as opposed to this 
vote that is kind of a concocted version of something that is later going to be used to attack. And both, I mean, both parties are guilty of using it in that means. So um, that's also another reason you, that there's less of an impetus to get rid of it. Um, but if we could move towards a place where everybody agrees, okay, in 2025, no motion to recommit. That way, you know, of course, we think we're going to be in the majority. They think they're going to be in the majority. And you actually do something like a quorum call before a big vote instead. And those 20 minutes of debate, in fact, is based on the actual bill you're going to vote. Mm -hmm. It that would, would, be it would really look like the way people think Congress is supposed to work. Yes. So I want to ask you each a little bit of a policy issue, and then we're going to open it up for more of a conversation. You know, I, I was looking at what to ask, and it was challenging because you've all actually done a lot of stuff. So these are not by any means necessarily the most important, but just things that we are interested in. And I guess I was going to ask you, Representative Slock, in prescription drugs. We're spending a lot of time thinking about this. It's an issue that really seems to be a moment where you could see both parties feel compelled to move forward. I know you've introduced the Real-Time Benefits Act, but just a little bit about why that's on the, you know, why that's at the front of your uh, mind these days, and do you think we have some potential? Yeah, I mean, I think it's on the front end of my mind because I can't get through the grocery store without someone pulling me over and saying, I can't afford my kid's insulin. Um, and when you meet people who tell you that their nephew is rationing their insulin or their daughter couldn't go to camp because they can't afford four inhalers that she's required to have, it's pretty, it's pretty raw mm -hmm. in my district. And it's compounded by the fact that I'm from Michigan, so we have a border with Canada. So my own dad goes across the border to get his heart medicine, right? We know what we could be paying on prescription drugs. Um, so I'm focused on it because uh, this and sort of the overall price of health care um, have made a situation where my people, people in my district are often paying more in healthcare and prescription drugs per month than in their mortgage. That is upside down, yeah. right? That is untenable. So, I, you know, that's why I'm passionate about it. Um, it is luckily an area where Democrats and Republicans say the right things. Um, where there's overlap, mm -hmm. and that is very, very important, and it's why there is the possibility for bipartisan legislation. People need to do more than talk about it. It's a great political talking point, and they need to actually turn it into legislation. I would love to see the president do exactly what he said he was going to do. I co-sponsored Bill on this. Allow Medicare to negotiate in bulk for prices, period. And he said it. It was like such a great thing. Um, there's legislation in the House. He's got to now use his influence with the Senate uh, Republicans so that we can get that done. That would be revolutionary. Um, so I've, it's pa I'm passionate about it because it's coming directly from the bone in my district. Um, and because I still think, despite everything, there, the average member of Congress, Democrat or Republican, knows that this issue is just out of whack. And there's political will to do something. So I was going to ask you about rural broadband. Because again, this is one of those ideas. We've been talking about it for 10 years. Telemedicine, 21st century workforce, basic equity. We did it with you know, electrification. NGA talks about it every three days. Why can't we get that thing to move? Like, what, what's, why, why is this one so hard? How much time do you have? You got uh, three to four minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we actually had uh, on one of, I'm on the agriculture committee, and our subcommittee had a hearing on this today. And we had a doctor who, in town from Georgia who is a, a specialist in, in stroke, um, in, in kind of stroke research. And he, as a physician, uh, conducts a lot of consultations with rural hospitals via uh, telemedicine capabilities. And he was telling a number of really tremendous, impactful stories. And my question to him during the hearing was, you know, I, I, in my perspective, in my district, I have 10 counties, seven of them are rural, seven of them have substantial access issues to broadband internet, and the other three are pretty much fine. I live in the suburbs. I've had broadband internet access from the time, I mean, from the time internet existed, it's the district I grew up in, in my district, in my portion of the district. Um, and I was saying to him, and I go out to my suburban communities and I say, do you know just 20 minutes down the road, they, they literally can't get connected in their house. You've got kids going to the McDonald's to do their homework. You have farmers who are going to friends' houses to do their invoices and the business of running their business someplace else because they can't do it from home, from their place of business business, which is their farm. Um, and so in talking to him, my question was, how do we make this conversation bigger and stronger? Because I'm talking about it. And when I talk about it in my district and in the suburban areas, people will react and say, 
I had no idea because why would they, right? They're not impacted. So what sort of groups need to engage on this? Does it need to be the Chamber of Commerce recognizing the economic impact of being able to attract more businesses? Does it need to be veterans groups? Because when you have veterans who want to retire someplace, but they need to be able to you know, uh, receive telemedicine uh, consultations from the VA, is that a constituency that can engage? Is it school groups? Is it churches? Is it religious organizations? And the problem is, is that it impacts people who, uh, you know, by virtue of the fact that they've got a farm in central Virginia and they're working every day to make sure those cows are milked and that they're running their business and they're, you know, getting their kids off to school and they're living their life and they're calling my office, but they're not joining together to lobby and make sure their voices are heard. By virtue of who's most impacted, I think that's one of the reasons why we don't see uh, a real shift, and there are, we've we have done a lot. I mean, it, it's a really truly bipartisan issue. We haven't yet found a firm bipartisan solution, um, but there is a real recognition that this is impacting our communities. And I had an amendment uh, for an appropriations bill. I guess, I guess it was two weeks ago that would increase funding to a popular program, the ReConnect program, by $55 million, which only represents a 10% increase. But uh, last year, the, the applications for every $3 requested, there was only $1 available. So it, anything kind of in the forward movement yeah. direction is good. Um, and we had over 400 people support that amendment. We did a recorded vote on the floor. So it is an issue that when given the opportunity to engage, people recognize it's a strong, strong issue. But I mean, I think back to my committee hearing today, it's how do we continue to beat that drum and get people to care about it in a way that the government's willing to say, this is an issue of infrastructure, this is an issue of changing the trajectory our country's on, and just like rural electrification of the 30s, if we don't make a change, we will have whole communities that are decades behind their neighbors down the street. So, Chris, I'm going to ask you an entirely unfair question, because it's going to draw all this together, and it builds on the conversation we had a month or so ago. Um, so half the eligible voters under 40 are expressing a preference for socialism over capitalism. A couple of um, Democratic presidential candidates were booed for expressing their view that capitalism was in fact a vital approach to entrepreneurship and social betterment. Um, you have some history with this set of questions having focused on you know, the B-Lab issue. Um, how do, how do you hear that? I mean, how do you think about what we should be doing as a country to make sure that the benefits of that kind of entrepreneurial possibility are shared more broadly? And are you worried about what's happening in the Democratic Party? Um, so to give everybody a little bit of background, part of my entrepreneurial journey was to be one of the co-founders and the first chief operating officer of an organization called Benefit Corporation, or B-Lab. And this was kind of a response to having run an organization that I thought was a beautiful company, a basketball apparel and footwear company called And One. And we tried really hard to not just make a lot of really cool basketball shoes and clothes and make money, but we all also tried to do really well by our community, by our employees by the environment as well. And when we sold that organization, uh, the gentleman who purchased it didn't think those things were important. So he destroyed the, the culture and destroyed the company at the same time. So the benefit corporation concept is something that I'm very passionate about. And you've heard it in some of this, the speeches of some of our current uh, candidates in terms of mandating this. I don't cur currently believe that our for-profit economy should be mandated to do good and do well. But I think that it is incentivized by our current millennial uh, population and generation to do the right thing for customers. Customers care about what kind of a company they're buying things from. I think we're being incentivized by investors. Investors care that the kind of company that you're, that you're working in is not just making cool product, but, but thinking about how you're treating employees, thinking about how you're treating the environment. So investors care. Employees care. They want to work at a company that takes that thinks about uh, those things and also allows you to bring your whole person to work at the same at one time. And so, 80 or 90 percent of our economy is the for-profit sector of our economy. A very small part of our economy is either the government or the nonprofit sector. And so, we have to harness capitalism for good. And I think we're heading in the right direction. So, I am 
anxious and frustrated when I hear the malignment of capitalism, because I think capitalism is a force for good. Um, and I think that we're just not seeing each other in our conversations when people are talking about the, the power of socialism, as an example, to understand that we really are making a difference and an impact in how we are treating the largest part of our economy, which is the for-profit sector. And so to that end, one of the things that people don't hear a lot about in this Twitter sphere is this really large group of people who are part of the New Dem Coalition. And the New Dem Coalition are 103 uh, strong caucus of, of Democrats who caucus over pro-business, pro-opportunity, pro-planet, pro-people kind of ideas. Uh, we are the largest ideological caucus in Congress that nobody has ever heard of. And I think it's really, really important to We've hear. We've heard of you. But Good. Probably doesn't Good. Say I'm heard. glad you've heard of us. And 40 of the new freshmen, more than 40, I think, are part of that, that caucus. And so we are trying to make sure it's like broadband, that people hear this message, you know, that they hear how important it is to make sure that we're taking care of our, our businesses because they are the heartbeat of the economy, small, small mid, and large-sized businesses. So to that end, that's why I'm one of the freshman leaders of, of the new Dems. It's to that end why I really am passionate about serving on the small business subcommittee as part of the complement of committees that I'm on uh, because I think that we have a lot of work to do to be a better economy and be better businesses, but I think we're heading in the right direction. All right, so you guys are so cool that I know people want to ask you questions, and I know that you also have other events where probably people will be giving you money, which we will not. <laughs> um, but as a demonstration of your commitment to public service, I'm sure you're willing to stay here for a little while longer. And if um, you would just grab a mic and let us know who you are, um, people will run back and forth. We're right here in the middle. Hollywood with the Blue um, Star Families. We're a nonprofit that helps mm -hmm. connect military families within their local communities. Yeah. Um, and every year we conduct uh, the annual military lifestyle study. And one of the really glaring results from that study is the unemployment rate for military spouses, which is about between 24 to 30 percent. And um, you know, compared with the unemployment rate now, it's a big it's a big challenge. So I was wondering what your thoughts are on how we can partner together, industry, government, nonprofits to help solve that problem. So um, I, as a military spouse, um, I feel really passionate about this. And uh, my husband's 30 years in the Army. Um, and I have a stepdaughter who's a brand new officer in the Army. And so um, I think about this one quite a bit. And frankly, if I hadn't run for office, one of the things I was going to do was try and harness the power of military spouses in a for-profit venture, because I think it's this hugely underutilized um, extremely well-disciplined, extremely capable workforce that, because of circumstance, is being kind of left out um, of their potential. Um, the big thing, honestly, that um, I know we're trying to do in our state right now is, and I, I wish it would just sweep the country, is reciprocity for spouses, military spouses, when they move from Florida to Michigan to Pennsylvania to wherever, so that you don't have to go get your teaching certificate all over again. And I, I honestly think that will be, um, a, a, we don't have a huge active duty military presence. We have a ton of uh, reservists and guard. But I think that that would be, um, like, it's a simple, logical, concrete step that state legislatures understand. Um, it's bipartisan, so it's great. Um, and I honestly think it could just sweep the country and do so much good immediately. So I'm a third generation military. My dad was was an active duty for 30 years. My grandfather for 30 years. So my grandmother and my mom were military Navy wives. You know, for the better part of 30 years, that was their career, and that was at a time when there really was no opportunity for them. They moved almost every single year, and the ask was to basically be part of the, the, to be the trailing spouse and to be part of the active duty member's career trajectory. And so my mom, clearly the smartest person in my family, the year that, that I graduated from high school, finished up the graduate degree that she had been working on in bits and pieces all through my, my career, my, uh, my childhood. And so one of the things I'm trying to do in Congress is we started something called the Service Women and Women Veterans Caucus. It is 51 people strong and bipartisan. You don't have to be a woman or a Democrat or on the Armed Services Committee to be part of it. But we're, ca we're caucusing on the issue of women of service, and I count spouses in that. About 20% of us are active duty or veterans are women, but about 70, 80% of us who are spouses are women as well. So making sure that we're taking care of uh, military families and specifically spouses is really important, and so we are focusing on some of the issues that, that Alyssa talked about, but also making sure that we have the opportunity of continuity of education so that you don't end up kind of uh, dragging around your credits as well. And that's what my mom had to do. She basically had to piece together a master's degree and then eventually a PhD uh, in the process. So really, really important issue for me too. 
This is not a shy crowd. Yes, uh, Kathleen, could someone run the mic over to? Hi, um, my name is Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, and I'm just thrilled to hear from each of you and what you've brought to um, Congress and what you, how you've inspired women across the United States. And it's really terrific to hear from you. Um, I'm working on uh, the issue of retirement security, so I just want to uh, ask you to think about this issue. Um, as you know, 50% of Americans have nothing saved for retirement. And largely that's because 50% of all business in the United States don't have a retirement plan. Um, we've done a survey, I know the bipartisan um, center has also worked on retirement security, but we've done a survey of um, 4,000 4, Americans through the AFT that says that if you give people, uh, 4,000 Americans in which 77% of Republicans and 77% of Democrats and 86 percent of millennials like this plan. So I'm just going to tell it to you briefly, and then you can go back to Congress and introduce it, OK? <laughs> if you say to um, a person who works for a business that doesn't have a retirement plan, contribute 1.5% of your salary, have it matched by the business 1.5%, they get to decide where they're, they could, that 3% is invested, like State Street or Fidelity or wherever. And when they retire, they'll get a monthly paycheck for the rest of their life. That gives them a portability. Right now, people change jobs all the time, and all their retirement is attached to their job. So what we need is a new system of retirement security that is not attached to the business, but goes with the individual wherever they go. Um, I'd love to discuss this with you after this issue. The Bipartisan Center has their own plan. There are lots of plans out there. But if you could take on the issue of retirement security, it's particularly important for women because they change jobs all the time. And the idea of having a portable retirement and not just one attached to their job is right for the new 21st century. Thank you very much. I think that's super interesting. I mean, the, and not only for women, but millennials. I mean, talk about people who are not going to be at the I same said, job. 86 percent of millennials like this idea. Yeah, the the the. I can tell you, they don't stay at yeah. one job for a long <laughs> <Yeah>. time. <laughs> um, so I think that's really interesting. I mean, frankly, um, uh, you know, I was a federal government employee, and so we have something called the Thrift Savings Plan, exactly. right? And I had it at CIA. And then I moved to the Pentagon, and it moved with me to the Pentagon. And then I came to Congress, and I reopened it again under Congress. So the same concept, basically. I think it's super interesting. I'd, I'd love to talk to you about it. It's great. Thank you. <laughs> Again, one more question up front. Hi, my name is Danny. Thank you so much for being here. I'm actually interning with Rebecca and um, Congressman Max Rose's office. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I was just wondering, as um, a college woman who's interested in politics, um, what advice you have, or just how you, you, you guys are really inspirations to me, but kind of like how you keep fighting and how you keep going. So I have three girls who are 27, 26, and 25, and my advice to you is life is really long. Do what you're passionate about. Find something that motivates you. Use the skills that you have in the best way that you can at the time that you're there. And don't feel like any one decision is the end-all, be-all decision for wherever you're going to head for the rest of your life. You know, I'm 52. I've had at least four different, very, very different careers. And they all, when you look backwards, connect and make sense. But when I was looking forward, made no sense. And so nothing is a permanent you know, choice. If you choose something that ends up not being the right one, use whatever you've learned and do something else with it. Because I think that there's too much pressure on you guys you know, to figure out what the right college is, what the right major is, what the right first job is, what the right grad school is. Just chill. It's going to be OK. <laughs> You're going to find it. I wish you had been my mother. <laughs> Don't tell my mother. Not too late. <laughs> I hope she's watching C-SPAN 3. Uh, <laughs> um, I would echo everything that Chrissy says. And you know, I have three girls as well, and they're 5, 8, and 10. And I think back on the career that I've had so far, where already I have made a number of changes. If you had told me 10 years ago that I would have left CIA, my dream job, 
to move home because it struck me as a great idea to bring my kids back to Virginia close to my in-laws and my parents and become a Girl Scout leader and live in the suburbs, I would have thought you were crazy. Um, but it, there became a point in my life where that actually really was the right choice for me. And I went and I did that and I worked in the private sector and for a time it was really right. And then things changed around me and I felt compelled to be a part of something kind of beyond myself, something that I believed in deeply. Um, and that's what drove me to run for Congress. And so, again, you know, if I was sort of thinking, would I do this, would I do this? None of it makes sense. But looking back, it makes perfect sense. And so I guess my advice would be do what you're passionate about. Um, do what can help you contribute in whatever way that you think is valuable, but recognize that there are different ways to contribute to your community, to contribute to causes and ideas that you think are important. I, I'm sure not to speak for everyone, but one of the things that I hear a lot from people, particularly women, uh, will be, you know, I, I would love... I would love to do something like what you're doing, but I could never run for office. And frequently I say, well, but you don't have to, right? You don't have to. There are a hundred different ways to contribute meaningfully to politics if that's what's important to you. You can be supportive of candidates, you can write postcards, you can dive deep into policy and advocate within your community, you can get a job working on Capitol Hill. There are 101 different ways that you can be a part of what you think is important. It doesn't have to be the kind of the, the most obvious choice. And I think you get to design what is that success, you get to define it, you get to choose it, and you get to create it for yourself. And frequently you'll hear people potentially tell you all the things you should be doing, but at the end of the day, if you have greater faith in yourself and your own choices, I think you'll create a path for yourself that will lead in the right direction um, and allow you to be the kind of strongest, best person that contributes in the way that's most meaningful to you and frankly to the larger community. So those were very inspirational things. I will therefore um, bring up the rear with something um, more mundane. I, 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 um, I, I think that most people, um, especially most women, actually know in their gut what the right choice is for them, but their head gets in the way. And all the reasons why that doesn't make sense or I shouldn't do that or that's too hard or it doesn't project the right image. And so I um, literally think of like um, Luke Skywalker in Star Wars where, you know, you have to control your mind to like lift the big ship out of the swamp. Um, and I, I think that um, that is... I was that like a Yoda is, impression any second. No. <laughs> um, but I, I do think that part of success is being able to control your mind and quiet your mind um, and um, and listen to those gut instincts and not let the like screaming voices in your head um, dominate your decision making. And I have seen, you know, I, I was an assistant secretary at the Pentagon. We had a very large office and I would just on the gender issues, I would do career consultation, you know, career help for people who wanted to just talk about where they were going in their career. And I'd have action officers, one male, one female, s almost the exact same job, sitting pretty much next to each other, same resume. And the man would come into my office and he'd be like, I've been on the job for a couple of years. I think I've really mastered it. I think I'm ready for my first level of leadership. I think I'm really good at X, Y, and Z. And I want to talk to you about that. He would leave. The woman would come in, same background. She'd be like, I've been on the job for two, two and a half years. I'm not sure I've mastered it. Um, I'm not sure I'm ready for leadership. I'm not sure, I'm not sure. And it was like amazing to me. So Jedi mind trick, control your own mind, quiet the voices, do your gut. I, I, we're gonna stop on that. Um, let me just say. There, uh, there have been few conversations uh, and evenings that as clearly remind me why we wanted to create something called the Bipartisan Policy Center and why we wanted to name a series in honor of Bob and Elizabeth Dole. And um, the three of you are doing democracy. And it's really beautiful to watch. And I hope we can um, support you as you go forwards. Thank you. Thank you so much.